Hi, and welcome to another edition of Tech Interviews. Uh, on this week's show, we're going to be taking a look at a potentially controversial topic as we talk about the idea of storageless data. So many of you may have heard about terms like serverless uh, and, and how they're changing the way that we develop applications and, and deliver applications into the enterprise. But what about we take a different view of the way we deliver data? Can we really deliver data without storage? Well, that's the kind of topic we're going to pick up on today. And to help me to do that, I'm joined by um, a returning guest to the show, actually. It was a long time uh, when when he was last on, but uh, Doug Falstrom. Doug, how are you doing? Hey, good. I'm doing great today. How are you? Yeah, real well, thank you. And, and thanks for coming back on Tech Interviews. Um, and the idea behind this show actually came about because of a blog post that um, I'd seen that Doug had written, where we talked about this idea of storageless data. Uh, and it really caught my attention. You know, people who've listened to the show before or have spoken to me and anywhere really know that I talk a lot about this idea of focusing on data when we start to design our, our platforms rather than focusing on infrastructure. So the kind of things that Doug talked about in that blog post really caught my attention, you know, and, and dovetailed really, really well, I think, with a lot of the conversations that we're seeing in the modern enterprise. So, um, but before we dive into that, um, Doug, why don't you, for people who've uh, not come across you before, not heard you on the show before, why don't you give us a little bit about of, uh, an introduction, who you are and what it is you do? Yeah, Dan, thank you again for having me on the show. It's, it's great to be on here again. So I'm Douglas Falstrom. I am the head of product at Hammerspace. I've been in the storage industry for what now is a very long time, um, since the late 1990s. <laughs> so you can probably do the math, it's many years. And you know, almost all along I've been focused on software. I mean, there's been a few hardware ventures along the way, but you know, what always compelled me to the storage historically, historically has been the fact that it needs solving and it keeps growing. And, you know, there's been very, very few ways to solve it differently. And I think time has not come to not think about storage anymore, but really to start thinking about data. And that's kind of where we've been heading for the last couple of years in this endeavor. And then we, we finally started to talk about it really in a way that I think is compelling uh, to where the industry has been, and, but also where it needs to go. Yeah, and I think um, I wholeheartedly agree with that. You know, I think as um, say people who've listened to this show before or have, have met me in um, in real life when we used to meet people in real life, of course that was, um, you know, know that I, I kind of have this conversation around a data focus and talking about things like data platforms on, on a regular basis. Um, and so, you know, let's um, let's kind of dip into this because this, this, you said actually, you know, you've been working in the storage industry since the '90s. You know, so um, uh, been around, uh, uh, I think, with, without sounding too rude. Um, and you would have seen a lot of change in that time. Um, and I think, um, you know, and I think one of these big shifts is this idea of focusing more on data. And I say this blog post that you wrote. I'll make sure that a, a link goes in the show notes that talks about the idea of storage of data. So, um, you know, so why don't we set some context around that? When you talk about storageless data, what is it that you mean? Well, it's interesting because, you know, you know, when you look at the industry right now and you look at you know, all the math or it's like, oh, so much more data this year, so much more data next year and so forth. But the numbers are just big numbers and it's really hard to put context around it. When you look at data as, as in when it relates to the application, I was talking to a customer recently uh, and, and, you know, they deal with large amounts of data and they were pretty obvious about it. They're like, well, we have so much data that it really is the data that needs to figure out where the compute is. Uh, and, you know, the data drives what the compute should be doing, not the other way around, which is traditionally what it's always been. How do I copy my data to where the server is? And they were like, no, no, it's not about that. It's about, and they were also focused on Kubernetes, but also, you know, other compute platforms. And they're like, we need to figure out a better way of disputing where the compute is. You know, there, there's so much more data, there's so much growth. We can't keep copying it or moving it in order to meet uh, where we think you're going to run the whatever program or, or compute platform you need. And yeah, it really is interesting because, you know, networks are, are great, they're fast. But when you start introducing the cloud and everything else, you can't move petabytes of data in minutes or, or, or even hours or days, potentially. And, and 
you know, just take your home video or something that comes from your house with your video surveillance. It's, it's a huge amount of data per day. And you multiply that, you know, with any kind of data stream today, it's just insanely large. And so we got to think differently about, you know, where is data stored, how is it stored, and, and how is it going to be consumed? And that's kind of where the storage testing has come from. Because if we want to make sure people think twice about it, historically it's always been, I buy a, a storage solution and I then put my data on it and then I attach a bunch of compute to it. And, and that's kind of like the way of data centers for the last, God knows, long, long time. And then we think it needs to fundamentally change. And we think, you know, people want to use things like the cloud in a very service oriented model. I don't think anything is new that I'm saying. I think people have been wanting this for a long time. What they haven't had the tools yet to do is to use it uh, with their data. And, and, you know, the way you have to do this, just like, you know, in many ways, Veritas was one of the first most software defined storage companies. And, you know, I spent many years at Veritas, obviously doing, doing that stuff. Uh, you know, being the first storage less company is really compelling because it allows people to think about data not having a vendor to put it on. You know, obviously data needs to live somewhere. You know, it can't live in nothing. But you shouldn't have to model your data center after where the data lives. Yeah, and I think um, I, I think that's a, a great example of the way that we need to have this kind of shift in thinking. You know, I, I think you said you, you can't, you, know, you you mentioned a point earlier on there that you know the the application shouldn't be dictating to the data the data should be dictating to the application you know it's because because i think ultimately it is the data and the information that that allows us to put together that's important you know we, we're focusing on outcomes we're focusing on results we're not focusing on what does the application look like what does the infrastructure look like you know and you, you kind of wrapped up at, at actually there in setting that context talking about something that you know I, I, we, talk, we talked about before we started recording but something i talk about a lot which is this idea of traditionally we've gone down the route of we deploy an infrastructure we buy our favorite storage array from our favorite storage vendor we attach that to some compute and we go to um, our business leaders and people trying to make decisions and, and drive business strategy and say to them look what i've done put all your data on that and good luck and actually we never really had the conversation around what is it that you want from the the data and the information it produces what what are the, the outcomes that we're, we're trying to get and i, I mean is that is that what's kind of driving this change in thinking for for you and for, for what you guys at Hammerspace are doing? You know, is that what you're seeing? Are you seeing real holes with the in that traditional approach to delivering data infrastructure, for want of a better phrase? We are, and uh, what's really interesting is, and it's been like this, I think, for a while, frankly. And the, the cloud, I'm going to call it the cloud. It, sometimes it's multi-site, sometimes it's you know many flavors, right? But let's just call it the cloud. Uh, it's driving a need to use my data in other places. Uh, traditionally, the, the need have been, well, I need a DR for a backup solution. I can't have it physically in the same place, and therefore, you know, that's good. It's very, very different now. And, and you know, so if your data sits on your vendor, favorite vendor A in, in, I don't know, wherever your data center is, you for sure, that vendor is not going to be in the cloud, not in the form factor you're expecting, right? Maybe sometimes by brand, maybe it's different, and, and so forth at best. But it's very, very different. And then suddenly you're, you're in quandaries. Like now you can use the really useful things that you can get more value out of your data, whether it be analyzing the data or, or understanding what it is or understanding better compliance story, whatever it might be about your data you need to really could benefit from. Suddenly you can achieve that because you're stacked to hardware. It drives me nuts. So, you know, you, you really need to think about, okay, what I want out of the data and what value can I find that, you know, I am so stuck in the old ways that, you know, even though my new storage array is half the price than the old one and three times the capacity, that's missing the point with a mind. Right? It, it's not, that's not where you're supposed to be. You're supposed to look, okay, here's my data. Here's how much my data is going to, you know, not necessarily grow, but here's how much more value I need out of my data. Now I need to figure out how can I get the value there? And what tools do I need to achieve that? Or, or what platforms do I need to store the data in? To give me the freedom to achieve what I need to do. Yeah, and I, I think that that point there actually is, is is something that I see a lot when we when we talk in the enterprise, which is this idea of 
people want to get additional value from their data, you know, wh- however we define value, I, I suppose doesn't really matter for, for, for what we're chatting about because everybody's version of value will be, of course, different. Mm-hmm. But often they are so restricted by the infrastructure that has almost been forced upon them. Um, you know, and it's nobody's right. fault, you know, it's, it's because this is traditionally how we've thought of this kind of thing. And you talked about something earlier on around that idea of uh, kind of data portability, you know, that idea of that, you know, data is while applications and computer potentially quite easy to move data is really difficult to move because it's got size it's got weight you know people talk about data having gravity um you know is that is is that a real big challenge that you see you know you, you've kind of touched on there that people want to take advantage of new tools new analytics tools for example mm-hmm. it, is it when they've they've not had this kind of data focus originally is one of the big problems they have that they just can't move the data around in a way they need it this lack of portability is, is that a real concern for for the enterprises you're speaking with it is and, and it's really interesting because it comes up in the fact sometimes it comes up in the disguise of my you know i need a lower tco so you need to have, be able to have two vendors to compete against each other and therefore i'm going to pick a better mousetrap when i when i can get another 20 points of discount and, you know and, and that's that conversation is great and i'm highly supportive of it but that's you know that's not really pushing the boundaries where we want to be. You know, you want to you want to get to a point where your data is so portable that you pick the vendor or vendors preferably that best meets the performance or liability needs of your data. And so, if you need super fast performance, you can pick a vendor that does that without sacrificing protection of it, without sacrificing the fact that you want the DR copy in your favorite cloud and a backup copy in your other cloud because you're paranoid about you know where all your data is you want to make sure it's ultimately super protected uh, and you know so you shouldn't have to make those choices i mean we were talking uh, and i was working with with a very large partner and it's really interesting you know this whole pandemic has driven a very new way of, we all have lived through a very new way of, of doing work you know working from home mostly right and Sometimes people have, have local hubs they're able to work from. Not every place is as restricted as Silicon Valley. You know, it's, <laughs> funny enough, we've been very, very locked down over here for good reason, but you know, it is what it is. But what we found is, and I'll give you an example of, of a use case where customers are coming in, and this is in, in the media entertainment business where you know the artists are working on content and you know, their content, they're working on it, sitting on their laptops and, and the laptops at home is great. It's a fast local GPU, but you can't get all the data to them. We're not going to solve that problem. Uh, but what, what they've decided to do is they instead of use virtual desktop technology to connect into the, the nearest cloud they're sitting on. And, you know, so you're sitting close to a cloud and you get low latency access to desktop that makes it work well to work remote because, you know, it's less data to move when you just see some pixels move on the screen versus moving you know, 100 gigabytes of information. Uh, and but then you have four other teams that sit in different locations. They don't connect it to the same local cloud. But what if they could be connected to the local cloud that they're sitting and they don't have to worry that there's actually a different name on the cloud than someone else? And suddenly the data presented is just the same in both locations. You're working on high speed, you know, hardware sitting, doing your rendering business, doing your editing, and you kick off a job. And you don't have to worry as an artist, where's my data? Rather than I'm connected in the most optimal way from my home system or, or my local office into my local cloud and the data is yes. And you know, when you when you tell someone the artist, they're like, Yeah, of course, isn't that how it works? And we all know in IT that's not at all how it works. You know, it, it's very, very different. But you know, when you ask someone that is not a storage IT guy or girl, they they like, Yeah, of course, that's the way it should be. <laughs> it must work this way, right? And you know, when you tell them that they can work this way because they've been told no for the last, you know, at least now a year or two, they're like, they're, they're totally amazed. And you know, I, I love having the conversations, you know, with a person that isn't the storage expert per se, because their job is to use their data in a way that, you know, we or anybody thought was possible a year or two ago. You know, people kind of, you know, it's just like when you unlock the faucet or something new and it just kind of storms out that you get all these ideas in your head and suddenly they're like, oh, I could do this, I could do this. And it's just like a very, very small part of the industry. But just because you unlock the fact that data is so portable, they don't have to worry about which cloud it's in or which storage it sits on. As long as it's available, that's all they want. It's, it's night and day the way they think about it. 
and it unlocks creativity of their data that you can can get from, you know, I have a better mousetrap over here versus here. I think the um, I think that's a great example as well of exactly the way we should be shifting the way that we think about this because I think in your example, you know, that the, what you're talking about there is that you have a bunch of users who. You know, and, and, and strangely, I mean, how how I don't how I hadn't managed to think about the impact of of the COVID restrictions around the world that, on this kind of thinking. But as you said, you know, what you've got is a is a bunch of artists in this case working in distributed locations. They have absolutely no interest in where the data sits, and why should they? You know, why should they be bothered about where the data sits? Their job is to take that data, do whatever they do with it, be creative with it, turn it into information, turn it into you know whatever they need to turn it into. They shouldn't be hamstrung by an architecture that sits behind that that is stopping them doing all those things. And I think that's a great example of the difference between if you think about this from an infrastructure level versus if you think about this from a, a data point of view. Because from an infrastructure level, you're thinking about the things you talked about before, make it fast. You know, can I get it for 20 points less than I can get somebody else's? Does it do X, Y, and Z? But actually, from a data point of view, the idea is how do I enable all of my users? to get the best out of the data or the information that we have, you know, and that's a, it, it's a subtle change, but I think it's a, I think it's a really significant change, you know? So, so if, if somebody's listening to this and thinking, well, that sounds like an interesting shift, you know, what, what's, what, what, what kind of ideas or what kind of thoughts do you have on how you start to make this shift to a more data focused approach and, you know, and, you know, what, what, what do you, what do you see of some of the benefits of doing that? So, you know, I'm, I'm a big favor for learning to walk before running. Um, you know, sometimes in the, in the startup, it doesn't feel that way <laughs> because, you know, we try to run to the end right away and you know, rarely succeed when you do. And, you know, but it, it applies to many levels in life and it includes your data. So, you know, I, I think that anybody thinking about, well, how can I achieve this? Don't start with everything. Start small. Start with a, a, a project where you're like, okay, this is kind of how I would have done it yesterday. And I want to do it in in the new way, right? <laughs> in in a different way now. And, you know what what so I run and think about. Okay, I'm going to copy these files over here. It's like what do I need from these files. You know, what I what I intend to do with. What am I not getting from my data? And what, how am I not unlocking the value, either from other folks in the organization or 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 a process that I just can't get to. Uh, so I think starting small and and keeping it in a very uh, non-traditional storage focus is really, really important. Now, it doesn't mean that people should throw protocols out the door and applications away, because, you know, I think in the end, practically you're also constrained with what you, the tools you're given. So you can't go and tell someone like, oh yeah, all these great new things can happen if you change everything about everything. And that's not the point. I think the key is to find the right change that you want to do and not just change everything because you have to. Uh, and, you know, I think I, I like to find a balance and people need to find a balance between, okay, I can achieve this with, with, with a minimal amount of change, preferably. I don't want to rewrite my applications. I don't want to move from, from California down to, I don't know, to Colorado just to get to my data. I mean, I, I don't want to do these massive shifts. I rather want to be able to leverage, uh, you know, some of the things I have in place that it's not blocking me, right? Um, so I think that's, that's probably the first advice I have for anybody. The second, you know, you got to look at this from a, frankly, definitely not from an infrastructure perspective, you know, even, you know, you know, we have interesting conversations that goes to the, you know, the data analysts, right? I mean, they're, they've been at this for, for a long time and, you know, and I like those conversations, but, you know, sometimes they're maybe one level too far removed that, you know, it's not always productive because they're, they're hamstrung with what they're allowed to do, right? They're, they're still stuck. And so it's important finding the right intersection between IT infrastructure and, and the consumers of it. And having those conversations is, you know, and, and people need to be open to understanding that, hey, things can be done differently and you don't have to sacrifice a lot, but you need to think about things a little bit differently. And, you know, if anything, I think has taught anybody the last year now, year plus, is that you know we have been quite successful in the world 
working from home, doing things that we probably didn't imagine doing at all beforehand. Uh, but I think we also learned along the way all the challenges to doing that. And I think some of those challenges we just thought about differently. You know, my kids have been home for, for practically a year now uh, from, from, from school and everything else. And, you know, we, we've learned to adapt and we learned to think about the problems with, you know, the, with, with that in a different way. And I think IT is the same way. You got to sit back and look at it and it's like, okay, if I have the freedom of having my data anyway, Without any call it penalty, no performance problems, no cost, no nothing. You know what would it look like? You know, what applications maybe would I start with? Is that a you know backup problem? Is it a DR problem, or is it maybe okay? No, I mean maybe it's a front end or a pipeline problem. I need more. I need easier way of doing things. You know, so you can. Some people have found. They start going at it from bottoms up, and that's okay because everybody's mind works a little bit different. And then some people just think, about, okay, maybe I can solve my. You know, we work with one company; they're solving their their ransomware problem differently. And you know, I think my first conversation with a sales guy that, that sold them, I'm like, we don't have a ransomware problem pr product. That's not what I built. I built a different product. And you know, but I'm like, I'm like you're also entirely correct. <laughs> it's, it's fine to solve the problem this way because it, it meets what they want to do. They want total freedom from their infrastructure and protect their data. In their case, what they want to do is protect it from from ransomware and from prying ice in the cloud and so forth. And you know, they want independence from the cloud. They want independence from the storage vendors. And it, you know, when you went down the line, you're like, you know, they came it came at it from an infrastructure perspective through and through. But what they're really getting out of it is something very different for the data. And, you know, so I, you know, I try not to be too you know, dismissive of from which angle you come from, because it can be equally, they may not realize it, but they're going to, you know, in the perfect direction, even when they're thinking about it from, a, from an infrastructure perspective. Yeah, and I think that's, um, you know, I think they're, they're all really good examples as well, you, you know, and, and, and in that kind of that advice that you were giving, I, I think some, some, you know, really, you know, key, key elements in there. I think, yeah, absolutely that idea of e even in that last example, you know, that somebody's looked at that and said, actually, I could see if I thought about the way I handle data differently, I could solve a ransomware problem, you know, and they're not, they're not thinking about that from a, oh, I need solution X or I need platform Y. They're thinking about, actually, if I did this differently, I could solve that issue and I could probably get some other benefits from it. But they, they, they've thought about the data and how do I, you know, as you said, how do I protect that data from ransomware? How do I protect that data from prying eyes on the internet while enabling all of my users to utilize the data to, to get the business outcomes that they need, you know? And that's a, that's a subtle change. But I thought it was, what was really interesting as well in what you said was that, that idea of kind of two things. I think one, abstracting the way we deliver the data from the underlying heart infrastructure so you know as we said earlier on yeah while, while we've talked about storageless data in the same way that serverless has a server involved somewhere you know data has to live somewhere it can't just live in some magical you know mid middle state somewhere where you know it just appears it, it's got to right. it's got to live somewhere but i suppose the important part of that is that it lives there but we're not restricted by that and we can give that data portability to put it and make it accessible in whatever places that we need. Um, and I thought the other thing that you said that was, I think, hugely valuable as you start to take this shift, because while it's a while it is a new way of thinking and is a strategic shift, you want to be able to deliver that shift without a massive change in everything else that you do. You don't want to have to refactor all your applications, replace all your hardware, think about completely new ways of doing business. You need to be able to do that in a way that you're taking tactical advantage of solutions that can allow you to meet a strategic goal. So, so I thought lo loads of really interesting stuff in that. And um, so, so yeah, you know, before we wrap up here, let's let's have a little chat about um, you know it's what you, kind of last time you was on we we talked and introduced a little bit your your company Hammerspace. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what Hammerspace are doing to enable people because ultimately we need technology to enable this kind of strategy. So so what is it that Hammerspace are doing today that are enabling people to have this kind of more data focused approach? It's been really interesting. You know, our we've been building up for three years, if I dare say. <laughs> so you know, quite a while. And you know, just like anybody, we thought we would be done with the technology a lot sooner than the reality struck us. Uh, you know, the key part for us was data portability. We built that you know years ago now, very early on, 
but it was somewhat constrained. It didn't have the global aspect to it. So I think we brought out, you know, the storage as data concept and then kind of what we focus on a lot was powering behind it is independence from, from hardware, independence from the cloud. You know, as in you can keep your data on your favorite cloud and that'll be great. But you know, we can we can help you even within that on making sure it sits on the right cost, performance ratio, and so forth. And you know, so not only does data need to be portable, it needs to be able to move non-disruptively. Right? So you need to be able to get to the data without taking an outage or waiting for it in an you know abnormal amount of time. And speed of light is always a challenge. You know, we're not gonna solve that, you know, at least not in this startup. But you know, it, it's something that you know it, you can also work around, you can also help customers work around. Uh, but, you know, what we really built now, what we launched is the global file system where you truly have a global namespace. And, you know, it's not a synchronized kind of like copy data everywhere and, and the policies will just yes, sync your data right left and center. No, it, it's a single namespace that presents the same information everywhere. And, you know, the further away, maybe it's a few seconds delayed and that's usually okay. You know, you, you, unless you work on the same file, maybe you need to be a bit more creative in the way you approach that. Uh, and that that is you know the most exciting part, and you know we we just moved that into full GA, which you know, as exciting it is, is also nerve wracking. Right? So now you have customers running in production of your data, and uh, and that is you know probably the proudest moment the product guy can have. By the way, <laughs> you know people then trust their their life code with, with you know to your product, which is fantastic. And you know the next phase and what we're finding is that now that we've given people the tools to, to have their data anywhere, to access it very easily, they want to find out more about the data. They want to add information about the data. So we have, we have projects with, with customers where they want to use things like tagging or information about the data to determine to make better business decisions. You know, so if they, you know, simple example is projects for, for just artists. I mean, we're working with a big partner on that and, you know, and they're like, oh, you can add tags for projects. And, you know, they're like, yeah, I'm like, yeah. And so that means that they could have a project for movie X uh, or, or commercial X that they're working on. And they know that in Vancouver, when they work on it, you know, the next phase is in, 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 in Australia, perhaps, or somewhere in, in, in Asia. And they know because of these tags, the data will be pre-populated at this time. And they can solve any latency problems. So people just continually and transparently work on it. And, you know, but they don't have to go through complexity. So along the way, uh, just like, you know, you just kind of click on your favorite cloud storage app and you can upload the data. Well, it's simple. And, and that's the, been the number one mantra for us as well. We must be simple and be able to get up and going for someone that doesn't know storage, right? I mean, clearly there's some storage to it, the, the protocol, right? And, you know, there's something to it. But it must be simple because what we're also finding is that the skill set of people that truly understand the architectures behind everything, it's rare to have the skill set in a broad way. Now, people want to buy a service because it's simple. And, and you know, I think when you look at what we're doing right now, consuming us as a service, even though we don't kind of sell us as a SaaS model, but consuming us that way, it's so important because if you can be up and running in minutes, versus something that might have taken days, weeks, or months to implement. You can then figure out immediately if you get value out of it. You don't have to wait a long time for that to happen. And it also, you can spend a lot of time, a lot less time doing kind of complicated storage things and just kind of consuming the data. So I think getting more value out of the data and helping customers do that is, is our next big thing we're helping with working on right now. Uh, and, you know, and, and we're doing with customers right now, just using the metadata because, you know, being lightweight and small is important and taking that and, and doing things with, with, with it that people never imagined you could. Uh, and so that's super exciting. And, you know, seeing people yeah. come in and, and they're like, we, we're sometimes upsetting, you know, frankly, decades old architectures uh, and then some customers and they're like, yeah, we wish we would have had this years ago. Because with you know they have teams, even teams within Europe between you know mainland Europe and UK, we have a customer running a, you know a, a multi-site in that environment, and you know, for them ease of use of just having the data there, so they never work on outdated data, right? So the data is portable instantly when they need it. That's immensely powerful, and you know the moment they got you know 
into two. Not everyone going to say, well, I have these other teams in these other countries. I'm like, well, okay. And, you know, so, you know, things expand, right? And, and, and things grow. And, and, you know, people, the moment they realize how simple it is and how fast you can go from disbelief to, wow, it's really working the way, you know, the dude told me. And, and they're like, then they, then they, then they unblock the infrastructure headache and it goes away. And they realize how much more value they can get out of their data by giving access or having these other teams operate on the same thing in the same way without requiring you know, massive data center things. And you know, so it's very, very exciting. Yeah, and, and I think, I, I, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've obviously you've been on the show before, and, and we've met in, in real life a couple of times as well, which is uh, say, re- remember the days. Um, and right. you know, and, and It'll again. It'll I, I'm a big again. fan of kind of what you got. <laughs> yeah, it will. It will. And um, you know, and I'm a real big fan of the technology approach that that Hammerspace take to to this problem as well, because I think, you know, you, you've described there a, a couple of areas um, that that I think makes it an attractive proposition. One, easy to deploy, relatively lightweight, um, doesn't require you to start moving data from a, a, a traditional and established platform onto some new platform nobody's ever heard of because we're, we're not doing that. You're kind of, you know, it's interesting you're saying about um, upsetting potentially decades old traditional storage environments. You know, but I suppose sometimes I look at it the other way in that actually you're not doing that. You're still utilizing that that underlying layer and giving it a capability that it couldn't do. And it's allowing an enterprise to take a different approach to the way it delivers its data without having to throw away all of its investments, all of its good practice, all of its data protection. So so I think it's a, it's, it's a really fascinating approach to something that is a, you know, at one end is a traditional problem for IT. How do I move? How do I give data this data that's got weight, it's got size? You know, you talked about the speed of light. How do I get that into the places that I need to be able to get it? But it's also enabling you know, a much more intelligent way of thinking about data in that put the data first, put the outcomes first, put the information that we want and business outcomes at the forefront of the way we design it. And then let's build a platform underneath that that enables that that element of data. So, you know, I, I think it's a it's a fascinating com, uh, conversation. I think what you guys are doing at Hammerspace is, is real interesting. And, and if, I mean, if people do want to find out more about what Hammerspace are doing or find out more about the kind of stuff that, that you're producing, Doug, in terms of articles, et cetera, is there a good way they can do that? The best is just literally go to hammerspace.com. You know, we uh, a blog, so and then, you know, you click contact us. I, I see the emails. I see the I see the chats come in. Uh, you know, I'm not awake all the time, but it feels that way, and I, it's very exciting to, <laughs> to engage with customers this way. And you know, part of what really drives a small company is really the one-on-one engagement with customers that you don't get in a large company. And I think Hammerspace is a perfect picture of that. You know, we, we love engaging even with large organizations, but having that one-on-one relationship with, with our customers or vendors we're working with, and it, it makes night and day. And you know, suddenly it, it feels a bit more personal, even in these remote days where you, know, you don't physically see many people <laughs> that you know. So it's, <laughs> um, that's the best way to see me. And, and I believe um, if people want to try out um, the, the, the Hammerspace the portfolio of products they can do that as well is that right they can the, you know, it's interesting you know we have 10 terabytes for free in the cloud uh and, you know for hammerspace license i should say I mean, we don't pay for your aws or azure or gcp infrastructure uh, but we, we do offer it and, and that's in perpetuity so you know you simply just if you're an aws customer you just go to the marketplace the same thing for gcp or azure you do have to contact us so you can share the image with you and run in your account but it's free to try and free to run up to 10 terabytes. You don't have to pay us a dime. And, you know, I, I invite everybody to do this. And it, there's no, there's no, you don't even need to, you know, we get a license, frankly, you just go use it. And that's the best part. Makes it easy and simple. Again, you know, you want to come in and then give customers the experience where you don't have to go through the traditional way of doing things that takes a month or two. You just literally click the button up and running and off you go. Yeah, and 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 you know, I think, and that's a a key part of this as well. It's something that can be as you touched on earlier on, distributed quickly. You know, and, and I think you know, not just in terms of hammer space, but I think any technology adoption in the, the modern world that we live in, and particularly actually the, the way we live at the moment. You know, with the big disruptive infrastructure projects 
are not the way forward for for many of us. We need to be simpler than that. We need to be have more agility than that, you know. And so, so I think anything that can be deployed doesn't have to be overly disruptive and can enable new capabilities. You know, that's that's got to be worth looking into for in in my book at least. So, um, well, look, Doug, we, we've kind of run out of time here, and um, you know, pe- people won't realise um the, uh, the the shift that you've put in before that we we did this podcast. So, um, that's that's a story for you to share on another time, I'm sure. But, um, Doug, look, thank, thanks for being on Tech Interviews again. Um, really appreciate it. I'll make sure that we put links into Hammer Spaces as well as the blog post that kind of in, inspired us to have this chat because I think it, it makes an interesting read. But for uh, but for now, Doug, thanks for being on Tech Interviews and uh, look forward to having you on again sometime in the future. You got it. Thank you, Paul. And, and looking forward to seeing you soon and grabbing a beer. In this pandemic yeah, over. back in the day or in the future yeah. indeed. So, uh, well, thanks, Doug. Uh, see you again. I hope you enjoyed that. For show notes, pop over to techstringy.com. We'll also find all of our previous Tech Interviews episodes. And if you've got an idea for a show, would like to appear as a guest, then why not email me at podcast at techstringy.com. Now, we're going to be off for the next couple of weeks. It's the Easter holidays here in the UK. But if you want to make sure you catch up with Tech Interviews when it returns, because we've got a host of great new shows coming for you, then why not subscribe? You can subscribe right here on YouTube, as well as all good homes of podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Spotify. So until next time, thanks for watching. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.